My name is David Peterson, and these Colorado Rockies have been my home for more than half my life. Growing up in a Bible Belt culture, I felt instinctively alienated and was frequently in trouble. My savior was the outdoors. Through camping, hunting, and fishing, I discovered the true home of my heart, wild nature. I'm an old man now, nearing the end of my trails, yet nature remains my primary source of solace and sanity. Nature and my inseparable partner for 36 years, Caroline. From the time we came to Colorado, a significant annual ritual has been my September bow hunt for elk, being both a utilitarian hunt for organic wild meat and a spiritual immersion in the harsh beauty of death's essential role in life. This is the story of those parallel hunts out here on the wild edge. Hunting with a longbow requires you to get within 20 paces of your prey in order to assure a perfectly placed shot and a humane kill. To do this, you have to be as stealthy as a cougar, as patient as time. So why, it's fair to ask, do I hunt with a longbow when the goal is meat and this is the hardest way to get it? For one, it is the hardest way, thus the most rewarding, win or lose. And two, this zen-like approach to hunting allows me to spy on intimate, relaxed moments in nature, like that cautious bear back there. For thoughtful hunters, the best memories of the best hunts have nothing to do with killing, but everything to do with an honest engagement in life.
that second gully right where we went across this morning. Among the acquired skills of a successful hunter is knowing when to walk away and leave it for another day. It's getting dark and the month-long archery season has only just begun. In 1968, I quit college and joined the Marine Corps in a desperate attempt to escape a life that seemed already, at only 21, a dark dead end. While my six years in the Corps gave me a level of self-confidence I'd never have known otherwise, I remained disillusioned with culture. Like so many of my Vietnam hippie generation, I felt painfully estranged. After the Marines, I lived on the beach, finished college, pumped iron and ran marathons, and even attended law school for a while. Yet I suffered increasingly from angst and depression. Then I met Caroline. From the start, Caroline and I shared a passion, not only for one another, but for wild nature, camping and hiking at every opportunity. In 1980, we decided to trade California's sandy beaches for the Rocky Mountains and took to the road. After months of exploring, we found a place to make our stand, having fallen in love with a lime green grove of quaking aspens, we took a loan and bought. That would be the first and last debt we would ever incur. Scraping together another $400 cash, we bought a long abandoned 1950s travel trailer, cleaned out the accumulation of rat droppings, and moved in. At first we had no water, no electricity, and I had to dig an outhouse. To water our little vegetable garden, we fill buckets at a nearby creek. For heat, we found a discarded pot-bellied wood stove, and we pretty much subsisted on rice, beans, and tortillas, trout I caught, and elk and other game I hunted or scavenged as roadkill. As we could afford it, we hand-built a modest cabin home. As the years ticked by, mountain life got easier, if still never easy, dishing out prolonged power outages, below zero cold and roof-crushing snow, devastating wildfire, and some pretty serious medical issues with no insurance and no regrets. Such a simple, self-reliant life close to nature is exactly what we'd come in search of. I've been single, I've been unhappily married, and for the past 32 and more years I've been very happily married, which I highly recommend. trick is finding the right one. At first light, I pull myself away from Caroline's magnetic warmth, 
put another log on the wood stove, make coffee, and take my wife a cup in bed, feed the dogs, and head out to my riding shack for a morning's work. Decades ago, when I first read Edward Abbey's classic, Desert Solitaire, A Season in the Wilderness, it lent clarity to my unfocused life and encouraged me to become a writer as well, something I'd never before considered. Today, after many years of doing it, I still struggle to evoke the palpable essence of wild places and wildlife for readers who will never know these blessings for themselves, hoping to open more lives to the transforming magic of nature, as Abby did for me. Not everyone can live on a mountain in Colorado, yet words can work to close the distance so that nature can be a blessing in all lives, no matter where. Uh, certain when I when I talk about my life, certain themes kind of recur, and one is that all most all of the best things in my life have happened by accident. It's almost like I didn't choose them; they chose me. And elk is certainly in that category. Uh, I knew that elk existed. I never thought about hunting them. Uh, it had nothing to do with why we moved here. Uh, we just came here and, and the place was welcoming to us and, and so we stayed. And only after that did I realize that I was in the heart of elk country. Elk and bear are kind of a, a toss up for, for my totem animals, but I don't hunt bear uh, because they're just too much like me. <laughs> I, li I think of bears as humans in a more primitive, natural, uh, pristine state. So I'm not interested in hunting them, but elk, I mean, they're, they're the emblem of, of these mountains. They're very challenging to hunt, physically and, and mentally, uh, and they're so good to eat. So, you know, I, I love them as food, I love them as, as uh, uh, an opponent in the hunt, um, or maybe I should say a partner in the hunt. I love the country that they live in. Uh, I love everything about them, and it just took over my life. This is fairly fresh elk scat. side of the pond there. 
What kind of stories do we have to tell? Are we proud of everything we did and are proud of everything we didn't do? There's nobody watching us when we're out there, so it's up to us whether we do the right thing or not. Uh, it's not, we're not doing the right thing because there's some law telling us we have to. We're not doing the right thing because we're afraid someone else will see us and think badly of us. We're doing the right thing because we don't want to think badly of ourselves. This is why it all comes down to the individual hunter's heart. Uh, if hunting is to deserve to survive or not. So the basic core of fair chase is the animal has a better chance to escape than we do of bringing it home. Uh, and that we don't use inappropriate means to take inappropriate advantage of the animals. We don't bait animals. We don't use night vision optics. We don't shoot out of a motorized vehicle. We don't herd them up. We just do it right. Okay, this is what we hunt with. It's called a broadhead. Uh, and it is basically a scalpel attached to a stick. And that stick needs to weigh as much as possible. Um, so the weight and the momentum push the arrow through the tissue. It cuts the tissue like a double-edged double scalpel going through and either kills by bleeding, by cutting arteries, or if you do it right, uh, it kills much faster if you get a full pass through both lungs. It, I know this is a little morbid, but this is, this is you know, what hunters do, so we might as well face up to it. But uh, if you puncture both lungs and the arrow goes through, you've got holes in the lungs, they're like leaking balloons. The air goes out, the brain is starved within a matter of just two or three seconds, just like that, and the animal doesn't go anywhere. So that's the goal. This is the bull I killed last year. I put the arrow in the right place. It went through both lungs. It missed the heart by an inch. Uh, went out the other side. He went up the bank behind the spring, uh, took a few steps, and stood there for just a second, looked around, fell over dead. Simple as that, just, just seconds, 15 yards is as far as he got. For me, every set of antlers I look at from every animal, I've, every male animal I've killed, I instantly can flash back to that scene, to that story, to that hunt, and it's, it's like a book or a photograph. It, uh, it, it keeps it alive forever. So when you make a bow like this, you take, you find one grain of wood that goes continuously from one end to the other of the stave or a piece of log that this is literally whittled out of. And you follow that grain with all its dips and grooves and uh, they are all individually handmade. Nobody makes them in a factory. It's usually the people, you know, just make them for themselves and their friends. And it, it is the highest, purest form of bow hunting and archery. For hunting, it all comes down to that one moment. Uh, the moment of truth in a very big way. Uh, you either make a perfect shot, animal dies very fast, never knows, knows what hit him because an arrow is a very surgical, painless tool. Uh, or he gets away, you have a clean miss, or the worst possible thing that can happen to any thoughtful hunter is that you have a wounded animal. And uh, that's to be avoided at all cost. I've got the animal out there. This is the animal I want to try to turn into meat. Uh, it's presenting itself in a, in, a, in a good broadside way where I can get to the lungs and maybe the heart. Um, it's relaxed. It doesn't know I'm there. So I'm going to make the shot. I just come to full draw, stare at the spot I want to hit when everything feels right. The arrow takes off on its own.
For 30 years, I've never gone two weeks and not seen elk use that spring day or night. Uh, we checked the other spring this morning and not using it either. So that would sort of uh, reassure me that it, we haven't blown them out of the one that we've been watching. Uh, the mystery continues. Where are they drinking? They could be coming all the way over the top and down to the creek at night to drink. <coughs> um, I have no way of knowing about that. They're all wadded up in one herd or maybe two or three herds on the whole mountain. And so your chances of seeing elk are far, far less than a month ago when they were just roaming around willy-nilly. Uh, so if you see them, you're likely to, they're likely to come in a great big herd. So there still should be a few loose animals roaming around. Uh, even now, but it, this is it's much, much tougher now uh, at this point. September, the sweetest time in the Rockies. Flaming aspens whisper and sigh in the cooling mountain breeze as elk sing passionately of lust and life renewed. The tourists and other bugs have gone, the weather is gentle, and the air is rich with the spicy scent of changing seasons. Yet autumn, like life, is fleeting and I'm feeling a growing sense of urgency. Before the big snows come to limit forest access, I need to kill and pack an elk off the mountain, and with Caroline's help, cut and wrap it for the freezer. In that same shrinking space of time, I also have to finish building the annual mountain of firewood, our only heat for the winter, when the wood stove crackles and pops 24-7, months on end. Here in the high country, you either think ahead or you'll wish you had.
slow down just a wee bit. Got an old man here. Ten years ago, we had what was called the Missionary Ridge Wildfire. Firefighters from all over the country and Canada said they'd never seen more intense flames. After they let us back in, both of us just out in this heat, just feverishly working, clearing brush away from the house. The smoke was so intense that there's videos of birds flying across the sky and just dropping dead out of the sky from the smoke and the heat. Uh, so it was a man caused fire, is in the, not just in the way it got started, but because we didn't understand and mismanaged our forests for over a century. We're getting all this oak brush, which is excellent for all kinds of birds and wildlife. So it's a good thing, uh, but it breaks our heart. I, the, the mystery of just walking through those, those shady, flickering white trunk groves is just... Uh, but we cried, we cried for two months or something, <laughs> oh, didn't it we? It was terrible, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What do you think, Clara? Where's your brother? Homer! Good morning, Mr. T. Thanks for coming out. No problem. I'll let Law sleep. That's okay. Good morning. His name is Thomas Downing, but I call him Mr. T. Part Navajo, he's the only person I hunt with often anymore. Our shared passion for elk and their wild habitat makes us brothers. There are just two ethical and effective ways to hunt elk with a longbow. While I prefer to sit in silent ambush, Thomas likes to walk and talk, attempting to call him in, at which he's exceptionally good. With the archery season flying by and no luck with ambush, it's time to give Mr. T's strategy a try.
almost close. That so uh, the problem with hunting in this thick aspen is you get right on top of them and you can't see them. <laughs> What a shot. That's the problem with grouse. They just disappear. Doesn't matter what you shoot them with. They're really hard to find if you don't have a dog. Well, we had a little uh, tough luck on the hunt with Thomas this morning. Made what looked like a perfect shot. I actually felt like it was a heart shot. I mean, it couldn't have been any more dead center. Grouse came out of the tree, uh, flopped a couple times, and then we didn't hear anything else. And uh, all of us just thought, wow, what a lucky shot. You know, that's perfect. We were going to walk up there on that hillside and pick up the grouse. Well, we walked up on the hillside and there was no grouse. And uh, Long story short, three people uh, spent 45 minutes tearing that mountainside apart looking for that grouse. Left, right, up and down, the grouse had just disappeared and never found my arrow. That's the last grouse I'll ever shoot out of a tree. Um, that's about all you can do uh, is learn from your mistakes. Let's see, so what we're looking for is a, a dead aspen that's still standing. Uh, and it's not rotten, and that it's not too awfully far from the road. So I'm really fortunate to have a uh, torn rotator. Oh, damn it. I just got bit in the throat by a yellow jacket. I'm uh, extremely, extremely allergic to yellow jackets. So I'll just see how I feel. But uh, I may have to uh, I carry a injection kit, anti-venom injection kit in my hunting first aid kit. And I definitely should carry it here. I'm just stupid that I don't have it with me because cutting firewood, frequently the yellow jackets nest inside of rotten firewood. Uh, this could get interesting before it's over. Let's go get some medication. Ah. I really don't want to shoot myself up with that stuff. Dave says it's very unpleasant. Do not use with any other product containing epinephrine. No diphenhydramine. And I was wondering if I should give him that an injection. Can you swallow? Yeah. Yeah. Eyes are shut. Um, not shut. He's get a huge thing on his neck where the bite was. Um, Itches and hives spreading all over my body. I'm not gonna like this. And I wouldn't give myself the whole thing, but... 
She said she didn't know, the nurse. <laughs> she said it's what your doctor told you. Oh, yeah, look at my whole body. Great. Perfect. All right, it's done. We'll see what happens now. I've got the shakes really badly. Thanks for your help on that, dear. <laughs> Oh yeah, look at me. Look at my eyes. I'm even prettier than usual. Ugh. Hey Dave. Yeah, it found me. <coughs> yeah. You better believe it. Um, yeah, it's uh, pretty much right over the jugular vein, right there in the throat. It's starting to burn and hurt pretty good. Uh, but the hives and the itching seem to have settled down and uh, I'm not having any trouble breathing. My heart rate seems to be normal. So you think I did, I did the right thing. I'm glad this was just one. A whole little pack of them came out of there and just one of them just hit me. So cutting wood, that's the number one time I should, should have that stuff with me and I didn't, but guarantee I will henceforth. These tracks are on top of our tracks. I know they are. I didn't see them this morning. So after we came through here in the dark this morning, uh, a calf came walking up this trail, and a cow probably over here somewhere. These were deposited here last night or early this morning, almost certainly by the same elk that left the tracks we're seeing. But what this really tells me, again, um, sitting up there getting bummed because of not hearing anything, not seeing anything, and at the same time there's an elk, you know, half a mile down the hill. There's elk walking around and eating and pooping, so they're here. So uh, that's enough to uh, get my encouragement back up again. I've never been a trophy hunter. You can't eat antlers. Yet I love to hunt big bulls for the acoustical excitement and heightened challenge they offer. <coughs> Caroline prefers young cows, which are especially tasty and tender. So I compromise and enthusiastically pursue bulls, but in the end take the first legal animal that inadvertently volunteers itself, no matter sex or size. Either way, old bull or young cow, ethically hunted wild game offers huge moral and health advantages over chemically polluted production line meat product.
Wild meat is organic, local, and done right, cruelty-free. A gift from nature that sustains a bond of reciprocity between thoughtful hunters, our food, and the wild landscapes that nourish us all, predator and prey alike. While calling, pretending to be a flirty cow elk is an electrifying way to hunt, it too often ends like this, with an excited bull approaching to a point, but no closer, expecting the cow he's hearing to come the rest of the way to him. When she doesn't show, he gets suspicious, clams up and slinks away. Henceforth, a lot more difficult to fool again. Sometimes I get distracted from hunting just because of the beauty of the surroundings. It's a no-lose deal. It just feels good. I just this is the place I just want to take a nap. Uh, Aspen Grove is where my ashes will be scattered or maybe my body illegally buried if I can figure out a way to do it. I want to spend the rest of eternity in an Aspen Grove. You know, if someone does something nice for me, someday I'm going to do something nice for them. Well, nobody has ever done anything nicer for me than the elk and the trout and the aspens and the mountains and the clear air. Uh, I'm such a privileged person to have this. And I'm not just going to go through and suck out of it and not put anything back in it. So I became a conservationist. And I'm known as a critic of hunting. Uh, I just love it so much. It's like I want it 
you know, it's it comes from such a, a wholesome, totally human history. It, hunting is us. If, I want that good part to prosper. I hate what culture has brought into it. This idea that if you can buy something that saves you from doing a piece of work or makes it more certain or easier or faster, you should do that. You can't hunt without an ATV. You know, you've got to have this new high-powered fancy bow that'll shoot 80 yards. That is not bonding us with nature. Woodsmanship, learning about the fish and the animals and the place they live, that bonds us to this only world we absolutely know we will ever have. Uh, how could I do otherwise? You know, how could any thinking person just take and take and not give back? Autumn's first frost sparkled on the grass this morning, bringing with it a chilling sense of anxiety that extends far beyond the approaching winter. We've enjoyed an exceptionally rich life together, Caroline and me. Uncomplicated, mutually fulfilling, honest, and loving. Yet, here in the autumn of our years, it's increasingly all at risk, as Caroline has a monster sleeping inside her, in remission for years now, but poised to reawaken and snatch her away from me. Caroline is stoic and doesn't like to talk about it, so I try to carry on with life as usual, including my annual elk hunt, though increasingly reminds me of all life's shared bittersweet fate. Caroline, the elk, and me. Each September, I like to visit Mr. T's family elk camp way up high to swap stories with his father, Joe, and with Isaiah, T's oldest son, three generations of thoughtful outdoorsmen who value meat and dignity over macho and deeply respect elk and elk country. Hey guys, you wanna jump on the tailgate? We'll walk up. All right. We'll be quick. It, 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 it's kind of a... There's turkey track right here. Cool. Yeah, we saw some on the way up and Hi. grouse. Hi, Isaiah. How you doing? Good. On Tuesday, the day before yesterday, I was fortunate enough to shoot a 5x4 bull at about 12 yards. All so, right. We were talking just before he did it. Can you stand up? Can you? We were whispering. whispering. Yeah. Can you stand up? I don't think so. Can you stand up? Go, no, don't, don't, don't. And he, he started <laughs> to stand No, 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 no. And we were doing like that. And then... He turned his head, and his head went behind a tree, and he stood up, and I couldn't believe it. And then he drew. And I just drew real slowly and, and came just back like, to anchor. Yeah. You know, and, and then he releases, you know, and then we hear him fall right. almost immediately. You know, it's hard for me to keep the tears back when I come up on a dead animal. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the killing is, absolutely. you know, but, you know, but that's the way the universe you, works. You feel, <laughs> you feel remorseful in the beginning. In the beginning, you look, oh, I, I just killed this beautiful animal and then you oh wait a minute here i've got to i've got to take care of business I've you got nailed to it do it justice after i go through the little moment of reflection and appreciation of the animal and the place i want to get that animal taken apart as fast as i can i don't have to think about it anymore it's no longer animal it's meat that's yeah. right yeah, yeah and that it makes it easy on me and like you say it's doing justice to the animal because the faster you get it apart the, the better the meat absolutely will be. yeah was he a nice bull well, he's, he's, he's nice for me. I mean, he's perfect. Um, he's a five by four. Um, you know, there's people who get caught up in the whole trophy thing. He's a trophy to me as big as any bull, but more importantly, the meat. Um, my family depends on that 141 pounds of meat, as it turned out, and uh, we That's need it. That's bone so, ready to yeah, eat, yeah. 141 so, yeah. pounds. We need that, and um, it's been a couple years since I, I got that last one, so uh, India's been, my wife's been chomping, you know, to, for me to get an elk, so. It's good to have that meat again. Please have such good form. I did it. Most kids do. Like that guy talked about. Yeah. That's good form. 
I have a uh, matlock made it, made with bamboo. I got it. Um, some people at my dad's work that I know saved up their money and bought it for me. And it's called the Little Wolf because my middle name's Wolf. And I've had this for a long time. And I'm gonna get a new one so I can hunt some bigger animals. But I'm always gonna have this one. Mm -hmm. There we go. Not a bad start. A lot of times if I get a good arrow on the first shot, I just quit right there. <laughs> I say, that's enough practice for today. So those are all good shots, just a wee bit high. But Okay, let's go hunting. Bye, doggy. Bye, wifey. My skeletons aren't in closets, but scattered across these mountains. Every time I happen on one of them, I stop and reminisce and pay respects. This is the bull I killed last September which provided us with delicious, wholesome, good karma nutrition for most of a year. Well, yeah, this is as far as he made it. Not even 15 yards. I saw him go down. I knew he was dead. But I sat there for a few minutes and he uh, just... I don't like the idea of disturbing an animal until it's good and dead. I'll let him die in peace. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough time you know, when you've just killed an animal. On the one hand, I was extremely grateful that it was just perfect. It couldn't have been any more perfect with a rifle. I mean, he ran up here, stopped, looked around, boom, he's dead. He really never knew what hit him. There's not much pain involved in an arrow, if any. He just always sort of looked confused. So it's like, you know, how do you deal with these mixed emotions? Uh, just killed a beautiful animal. It's laying there. They always die with their eyes open. You can't even make them go shut. They come back open. So you're, it's very personal. You're, you're you know. Uh, so I just say simple thanks. Um, and then I get to work. Animal that was born on this mountain, probably. Lived his life on this mountain. Good life, died a good, clean death. Um, it's not, every aspect of it isn't pretty, but it's real, it's natural. Uh, it's the way life works. Thanks, Elk. I'm really discouraged, and I'm ashamed of myself for it. Uh, it's not like I haven't been through this before. Um, not this long, but I've been through this before. Uh, you know, it seems like even the coyotes and the bears and the other animals that were entertaining us earlier, they're gone. I haven't heard a bugle over here since I can remember. We're on the south-facing slope. We went around to the north slope with Thomas the other day. We got into some elk but not nearly as many as usual. Had to work hard. They were extremely shy. Um, they're not on this side right now. I say to myself, there's tracks that weren't here before, tracks up there that weren't here before. So I'm losing faith, and that's just wrong and stupid. Things can change overnight. Um, the 
have many, many times. And just to be here, I mean, <laughs> how can you be discouraged? There are literally millions of people trapped in concrete jungles with black and white lives all over the world that would give anything to spend an evening in a place like this. Elk or no elk. Um, so, you know, I can be discouraged if I choose to, feel sorry for myself, or I can keep an attitude of gratitude and just be thankful that I've got a life that allows me to experience something like this for a month and more every year. You win some, you lose some. This one ain't lost yet. We'll be back. So there's elk bugles at 10 after 5, uh -huh. which is the first bugle we've heard since we were around the other side of the mountain with Thomas last weekend. <clears throat> so that was, you know, didn't, didn't mean anything was going to happen, but it was appreciated. Uh -huh. And then 45 minutes later, not more than 100 yards away over by Elk Spring, there's a cow and a calf started chirping. So now we got elk behind us, elk in front of us, and the wind is kind of quartering. So we snuck all the rest of the way out. You could, we'll have to wait till tomorrow on the light to read those tracks. But... Um, <clears throat> Maybe more information than you want to hear. <laughs> but anyhow, we did the best we could do. We had a really good sneak. Good. If the elk had At just stepped out, it was already in range. And uh, we snuck out without them ever knowing we were there. So that's the best you can do sometimes. Mm -hmm. I've run away from elk a lot of times. So you go out in the morning? Well, I think we're going to go out with Thomas in the morning. And then we'll go back there tomorrow evening. It's his last chance to go out. We'll see, but we're both just fired up. Oh, you know? good. I mean, normal year, I've got elk running around all over all the time, but now, just mm -hmm. to know that there are even two elk there, it's just, I'm pumped. Oh, <laughs> good. Good. What's your dinner? Uh, soon. All right. I never ate soon before. Winter's creeping in. With autumn all but gone and hope fading like the fallen leaves, I kept at it and finally found the ghostly elk a whole herd of them, including a bull. As it happened, the first to volunteer was a plump young cow, one arrow to the heart. Caroline was delighted with the sweet, tender meat, even as her delight 
delight in me. But in the end, all things pass. That's the law of life. Too soon, Caroline's cancer awoke from its long nap, surreptitiously, a thief in the night. As her health declined, a litany of doctors and medical tests failed to identify the problem for what it was. Until one day she asked me to take her to the emergency room. The pain had grown too much, even for her. Within 10 days, the love of my life was gone, forever. And with her went the best of me. When my turn comes, my ashes will join Caroline's as special places on the mountain there to help nourish the wildflowers that nourish the elk that nourished us so well for so long. We are born, we live as best we can, and one day we mysteriously disappear, bequeathing the places we love to others to enjoy and protect. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, mountains. Thank you, elk. <laughs>